Mika Hakkinen's speed, skill, and determination behind the wheel was such that the great Michael Schumacher himself named him as the most challenging rival he ever faced in Formula One. From humble beginnings in a small Helsinki apartment, Hakkinen began karting competitively as soon as the rules in Finland allowed in a cart paid for by his father, who drove a taxi in his spare time to raise the money needed to match his son's talent. When he was 14, he won the first of four consecutive Finnish karting titles, and at 18, he switched to cars and immediately swept the board, winning the Swedish, Finnish and Nordic Formula Ford titles. The British Formula 3 Championship title followed in 1990, and winning seemed to come very easily to this hugely talented rookie. Formula One soon beckoned, and after a test with Benetton, he joined Lotus for 1991, having impressed team boss Peter Collins with his speed and rock-solid self-belief. Lotus were a shadow of their Colin Chapman heyday, but the 22-year-old was on a mission to prove himself worthy of his place amongst the best in the world. He made an immediate impact on his debut in Phoenix, qualifying 13th before retiring from the race with an engine issue. He finished 9th in Brazil, but it was in his third race that the paddock was really blown away by his talent. Starting down in 25th at Imola, he flew through the field to 5th in a race of attrition to claim his first F1 points. It was first time for me the race in a wet condition, F1, it was unbelievable. It was, you couldn't see absolutely anything. Even to the next car in front of you have a red light, you couldn't see that. A string of six further points finishes in 1992 enhanced his growing reputation. And while Lotus battled to keep him in the face of interest from top teams like Williams, he was soon on the move. Hakkinen arrived at the mighty McLaren in 1993, but with the great Ayrton Senna and American Michael Andretti filling the race seats, he initially had to settle for a testing role. He bided his time, and late in the season, Hakkinen was called up to a race seat for the Portuguese Grand Prix. He was ready to make his mark. After nearly a year out of Formula One, he made an incredible impact, out-qualifying three-time champion Senna at his first attempt. Mika, that is one fantastic return. You must be very pleased with it. Yeah, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. It could have been better. <laughs> In what way? Uh, to be first. It was a stunning performance that no one, except probably Hakkinen himself, would have predicted left Senna astonished. Ross has got away well, but so has Mika Hakkinen. And Cross is being crowded as he goes into the corner. And it's Jorna Lacey in the Ferrari, who has blasted through. From fifth on the grid, he leads Hakkinen. And I'm looking down the pit lane, and Hakkinen is right behind him. Oh, this is marvellous. Despite crashing out on race day, the flying Finn had made his point. He was now in a top team and ready to make it count. He followed his feather-ruffling McLaren debut up with a perhaps even more impressive weekend at the next race at Suzuka, sealing his first podium in motorsport's top tier. And this time, even Senna, who was leaving McLaren at the end of the season, was pleased for his young teammate. I think it's a, a very good start for him <laughs> and a, a very good way to finish for me. Yeah, it feels good. It feels really nice, you know. I wasn't pushing at all. 
and it was on point to push too hard and take a risk. Six more podiums followed in 1994. And in 1995, he finished second twice in the closing stages of the season, inching closer to ending his quest for a first F1 win. Hakkinen had high hopes heading into the last race of the season, but instead of fighting for victory, he would end up fighting for his life. In qualifying, Hakkinen was taking the 120 mile per hour brewery corner when his left rear tire punctured without warning. His car slammed into the barrier, the force smashing his head against the steering wheel and fracturing his skull in the process. An emergency trackside tracheotomy saved his life. He was taken to intensive care and regained consciousness the following day. It would be a gruelling recovery, and he remained in hospital for two months. So bad were his injuries, he wondered if he would ever fully recover let alone set foot in a racing car ever again. But just 87 days later, he was back in his McLaren at a secret test in France. And after completing 63 laps, he knew his dream was still alive, and his bond with both the team and boss Ron Dennis now stronger than ever. He proved straight away that he'd lost none of his speed, and 1996 saw Hakkinen in the points in 11 out of 16 races, including an emotional return to the podium at the British Grand Prix. For 97, McLaren had a new look, and a renewed sense that their time was coming. The car was getting better and better, and Hakkinen, now in his seventh season, came close to winning at Silverstone, Monza, and then the Nürburgring, where he took his first pole position, but either engine or tire problems denied him each time. But his time would come. The season finale at Jerez was all about the title fight between Jacques Villeneuve and Michael Schumacher. Oh, oh yes! Oh. Michael Schumacher out! After the infamous collision between the championship rivals, Hakkinen was running second to Villeneuve and reeling him in as the laps ticked down. Mika Hakkinen can see that victory, beckoning him. Look how close it is. He's got two chances, a small one into the Ayrton Senna chicane and then a big last gasp dive into the last corner. He knows Villeneuve will jump out of the way if he as much as looks at his rear wheel. And he does He's it. let him through. Hakkinen is going to win. Hakkinen is going to win his first Grand Prix in his It was the start of a new era. And when the 1998 season dawned, it was clear the new Adrian Newey designed McLaren Mercedes MP413 was the class of the field, with Hakkinen on pole at the season opener in Melbourne. A pit stop mix up in the race meant teammate David Coulthard slowed to allow Hakkinen to retake the lead in controversial circumstances. And Hakkinen takes the lead. Now that looked like a planned move to me, Martin. But McLaren had their 1 2, and Hakkinen his second win. After having to wait almost 100 races to get his first victory, Hakkinen now had two in a row, and the floodgates opened. What David did was just remarkable. Looking back in the history, I don't have seen many drivers doing things like this, so I have to uh, thank you very much. Wins in Brazil, Spain, Monaco, Austria and Germany followed as he opened up a lead at the top of the championship. But in Michael Schumacher, he had a lightning fast, tough and determined competitor. The two had first crossed swords back in their Formula 3 days, and now they were fighting out for the biggest prize in motorsport, the Formula 1 World Championship.
The German in the Scarlet Ferrari invariably won whenever Hakkinen didn't. And victories for Schumacher at the Hungaro Ring and Monza, where Hakkinen spun while chasing his rival, meant the two drivers were level at the top of the standings with two races to go. Hakkinen won next time out at the Nürburgring to take the title fight down to the wire. Irvine really beginning to struggle. Can he have a look up the inside and go for it, Mika? This is your chance. Yes. yes, nice, neat, clean, tidy. That was a great move from Hakkinen and very, very timely. At the decider in Japan, it was Schumacher who took first blood, securing pole position with Hakkinen alongside him on the front row. The stage was set for a titanic tussle between the two contenders. But Schumacher stalled on the grid and was forced to start from the back row. That is Michael Schumacher. Will he end up on the back of the grid? Listen, look, he's shaking his head, look. Michael Schumacher, under the terms of the regulations, has to start this race from the back of the grid. Hakkinen led, but incredibly, Schumacher fought his way all the way back up to third before a puncture finally put an end to his challenge. Oh, oh, so Schumacher's got some kind of problem. Schumacher puncture. Is that a real puncture, right rear puncture? Right rear puncture. Uh, it's all happening to Michael Schumacher today. Hakkinen pushed on to take a commanding victory, and with it, the world championship title he'd been dreaming of since he was a rookie carter back in Finland. Hakkinen literally goes downhill to victory. Look at the joy, the euphoria of the McLaren team on the left. And you are looking at the world champion of 1998. I don't know where to start uh, to, to tell my feelings. Since starting a uh, Formula 1 90. 91, uh, it has been a, a fight every year. There has been a, such a hard work for everybody. Uh, here we are, we won the championship. The following season, McLaren were fighting Ferrari again. Wins in Brazil, Spain and Canada gave Hakkinen the championship lead. But at the British Grand Prix, the season took a dramatic twist when Schumacher broke his leg and was out for seven races. Yet any hopes Hakkinen had of strolling to the title were dashed as Eddie Irvine stepped up to lead the charge for the prancing horses. With Schumacher back for the final two rounds of the year, Irvine won in Malaysia to lead Hakkinen by four points going into the season finale at Suzuka. Just as he had the year before, Hakkinen lined up P2 on the grid behind Schumacher, but beat the German off the line to lead and didn't look back, winning in style to seal his second successive title. He was now Finland's first double world champion. Here is the flying Finn. Mika Hakkinen wins in Japan. He is world champion. Immediately uh, realized I had advantage for Michael. Only what I had to do is to keep this position. Hey, 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 brilliant. The new millennium saw Hakkinen duke it out with Schumacher again for the title, and their rivalry hit new heights at the Belgian Grand Prix when Hakkinen became incensed of what he thought were overly aggressive tactics from Schumacher, as the German fought to keep him behind. Undeterred and with just three laps left, Hakkinen got ready to pounce. Now, Hakkinen's best chance is if Schumacher has to follow Zonta closely through Eau Rouge. And once again, look, Michael's having to defend, and Mika, and there's a, but the back marker's in the way. But can he do it? Yes, he's done it. A brilliant move there. And Hakkinen brilliantly takes the lead of the Belgian Grand Prix. And you can see the delight in the McLaren garage. A superb, gritty, determined, forceful move from Mika Hakkinen. It was great overtaking when you were in. I loved it. I'm not sure if the Michael did. It was a sensational move, and the win gave Hakkinen a six-point lead in the title race. Once again, the championship could be decided at Suzuka, 
and once again, Schumacher was on pole ahead of Hakkinen. But this time, the Finn could do nothing to stop his rival taking the crown, and was gracious in defeat. Ferrari's ascendance continued in 2001, and Hakkinen managed just two victories, first at Silverstone and then the US Grand Prix at Indianapolis. But even before that final win, he announced he'd be taking a sabbatical in 2002. Sadly for Formula One fans, the sabbatical eventually became retirement, and Hakkinen never again raced in Formula One. He had, in a decade, gone from fearless rookie through the agony of a terrifying accident to the very top of the world. The Flying Finn left a legacy of two world championships, 20 Grand Prix wins, 26 pole positions, and 51 podiums and being the driver Michael Schumacher feared more than any other. He was a gentleman, a fierce competitor, and one of the greatest natural talents to ever sit in a Formula One car. Mika Hakkinen will forever be a true legend of motor racing.